Hello, Dan. Good to see you. Good to see We're you in Vanderwagen, New Mexico, where our network isn't very stable, but we'll do the best we can. There was a song my mother used to sing me when I was a child. And it goes like this. I translated it from Navajo to English. And, it, and, it, and it's kind of a prayer that I do every morning. Uh, mother, sing me a song that I will ease my pain. Men broken bones, bring wholeness again. Catch my babies when they are born. Sing my death song, teach me how to mourn. Show me the medicine of the healing herbs, the value of spirit, the way I can serve. Mother, heal my earth so that I can see the gift of yours that can live through me. And it's a song that I continue to, to, to draw strength and power from. Um, I wanna introduce uh, Dan. Dan, uh, we've just gotten to know each other this year through the um, time of COVID, which I think everybody's gonna remember that. Um, Dan has been, uh, in the orga organic field as a farmer, as well as being raised in that, in that soil, you might say, in the organic soil. Uh, 30 years and is a founder and executive director of an organization called Bionutrient Food Association, which we have gleaned so much information. So if you get a chance, please uh, take a look at his website. <clears throat> it's a nonprofit organization really to increase quality in the food supply uh, known as the leading proponent of nutrient density. Dan works to demonstrate the connection between the, the healthy plant, healthy human bodies, healthy, healthy uh, microbiome uh, inside our systems. Um, and that's something interesting, to, very interesting to, to Joyce and I on, on, our, on our spirit farm we are looking more and more into that connection. And I know there's a lot of researchers and scientists that are now um, incorporating nutrition as a part of the health dynamics. I'll let Joyce. Uh... So out of his efforts, um, the Real Food Campaign was um, started, um, in which he has engineered a prototype of a handheld consumer spectrometer designed to test nutrient density. So when you're going shopping, you can use this to test the density of the food you're buying. And out of this, they're hoping to change the whole market and really push, um, change the way farmers farm into more of a nutrient focused uh, farming. So Dan and I, when we started talking, we started talking on a couple different levels apart from the nutrient uh, density, which we're, we're going to have some more conversations along the line, how to decolonize and create the, the, the indigeneity part. How do we become indigenous to not only on the farm, but how we approach life. And that's been really my, my push to, to look at the co indigenous cosmology. And maybe down the road, we can come together on discussing some of that. But I'm really excited to have Dan tonight and uh, looking forward to what he has to share with us. And uh, my prayers are for really the healing the earth. So I'm gonna go ahead and hand that over to you, Dan. All right, sounds like I can go wherever I want in this <laughs> topic conversation. <clears throat> um, my understanding is that you would like me to speak, I think you said to my soil story or you know, what has brought me to where I'm at. Um, um, and the work that I do, and then potentially we can have a conversation about some of those topics. So um, <clears throat> I'll, I'll spend about, about 20 minutes um, sort of rambling, um, as Isabel said, and then we'll see <laughs> where the conversation goes. So uh, <clears throat> yeah, I did, uh, I did grow up on an organic farm, uh, a small sort of uh, homestead um, subsistence farm. We had, you know, a milk cow and um, pigs and chickens and ducks and geese and uh you know small orchard and vegetables um we uh pretty much ate what we grew we bought you know grains um, and beans and salt um and pepper but mostly <clears throat> grew up um eating 
eating what we what we ate what we grew and and you know canned tomatoes and froze froze vegetables and and meat and uh, fruit so I uh, you know I think I had a fairly abnormal um, childhood for someone of my of my uh, ethnic origin and and time and place in history um, which I wasn't necessarily totally enthused about at that point in time but at this point I feel very <clears throat> graced to have had that experience um, and as I as I uh, proceeded through life and tried to find my place and purpose um, after a lot of questing and um, work doing various various interesting things among which included um, serving as a as a, a resistor a, a shepherd in Big Mountain um, um, late late 90s I was uh, I was I was down there in Arizona um, <clears throat> to support the uh, the grandmothers and grandfathers that were being removed from the land um, by the by Peabody Coal Company. So that actually was a moment where I um, I found the answer to the question why that I've been asking for many years. Um, I found it in a book about the wisdom of the East, the science of the East consciousness, um, and and headed off to the Himalayas shortly thereafter. But um, when in my mid twenties I I um, got married and decided to settle down and, and have a family and um, pretend to be an adult um, I I uh, or at least try to try to be an adult <laughs> um, I I had found no better lifestyle to raise a family in than on the land um, it just felt it just felt like if you're going to raise children you should do it in a way where they have um, uh, an intimate and sort of Un, it's just it's not even not even something they're aware of just that but their relationship with nature and and life is is foundational to to who they are so um i uh was able to save up a little bit of money and buy a, a worn out um run down wreck of a place um the fields are worn out the, the buildings are falling down it wasn't very expensive but i you know i was a farmer so i knew how to fix things up and um, <clears throat> said about being a farmer to um, to make a living, and in short order realized that the skills that I had uh, been raised with um, it, to be a farmer were were insufficient to make a living. You know, there's a lot of a lot of small farmers that really struggle uh, economically, and I had been taught by my parents who had a day job, which was running a local organic farming organization. Um, that organic was better. That you know, chemicals were bad, and 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 organic was good, and that was pretty a simple, a pretty simple dichotomy. Um, but when I started to take responsibility for my own production, I noticed that even though I was growing in, in a way that was quote unquote organic, you know, I certainly was. My plants were struggling with with pest pressure and dis and disease pressure and failure to thrive and and things like that. And I thought, you know, you look out in nature and you see all these plants that are doing just fine with no fertilizer and no management um, and these plants that we're putting all this time and energy into are are struggling um, maybe maybe what we're doing is is not all that there is and so I <clears throat> asked the question effectively you know you know if organic is is better than chemical you know what's better than organic because there must be something better than organic because um, my my plants shouldn't be struggling. If they were healthy and and flourishing, they wouldn't be experiencing this pest and disease pressure dynamic. So um, I, you know, read books and went to conferences and studied and in the wintertime and and experimented and practiced in the sun in the summertime. And it wasn't, it didn't take too long before I, I got the experience of um, <clears throat> plants flourishing and not experiencing pest and disease pressure and yields going up and cost of production going down. Um, you know, flavor, shelf life, aroma going up, soil health going up, um, and profitability. Um, and I, you know, got to a point where I could make my living off of my land in, you know, a couple acres or less um, in 20 hours a week or or so. And so I figured that was that was pretty good. Um, and um, <clears throat> got to thinking about the fact that if I grew up on an organic farm and my parents ran an organic farming organization and I didn't know some of these things about how to work more well with life, then maybe others didn't know them as well. And so I, I felt, you know, even though I was always quite shy and, and just didn't like to publicly speak or anything like that, I felt this compulsion, this 
this obligation to share what it was that I was coming to, not that I particularly understood it, but just that I thought it needed to be needed to be spoken about. And so, um, yeah, I started um, giving, you know, workshops, which turned into a course, which turned into an organization. Um, and for the past more than 10 years now have been have been uh, running uh, an organization called the Bionutrient Food Association. And um, we have we've been doing a, a two day course around the country and then now other countries, um, which we call principles of biological systems. And the concept is that, um, you know, plants evolved to flourish uh, in in synergy with nature and um, our responsibility as caretakers of the land is to create a dynamic where the plants are able to do that. And a lot of the things that we do, quote unquote, as farmers, tillage and fertilizer and, you know, seedling trays. And I mean, there's any number of things that we do that are very unnatural, um, very unnatural. And so it, um, it came to me more and more that, that by studying and trying to emulate the patterns of nature, we actually could have a better quality of life, do less work, um, you know, have more economic viability, uh, better quality, you know, just time with your children and things like that. And so, um, so we've been teaching this course for, um, for quite some time now. Um, and, and the, and the principles are very simple. I don't know if I have enough time to go into it completely, but, you know, from a scientific standpoint, the idea is that plants are green, um, in them, in their leaves, they have these, these chloroplasts, they make sugar, um, in chlorophyll and um, you know they make sugar and oxygen and the oxygen gets emitted into the atmosphere and the sugar gets emitted into the soil to feed soil life the bacteria and the fungi which are the the bottom of the food chain the um, the gut flora of the plant the microbiome of the plant and it's those microbes that have the ability to digest the soil and also to digest the atmosphere to pull nitrogen out of the atmosphere to pull copper and zinc and other things out of the soil. Um, and the plants have evolved this really profound relationship with, with the microbes where they say, you know, we need this, here's some food for you to go get it. And the plant and the microbes go get it and they feed the plant. And it's just, this, it's a beautiful virtuous circle. And so um, we, you know, taught these courses around the country and um, different climate zones, different crop types, different, you know, dynamics. And, it seems like in just about everywhere, it, when you work in harmony with nature, um, life does better, <laughs> which is one might argue, um, you know, self-evident, but um, apparently is a bit of a revelation to some people. So the, you know, we as we proceeded and said, look, this is this works in in California and Michigan and North Carolina and Massachusetts and Ireland and Australia. Like this, this these principles work everywhere um and it looks like people get healthier when they eat better food it looks like farmers have a better you know quality of life you know economic just ability to function um that the soil is healthier the ecosystem is more functional um you know what would it be like if if the way humans engaged land broadly was in this way of of harmony with nature um, service to nature even perhaps um, <clears throat> and so then we started to think about how can we support that kind of reality happening you know what would be a way to to support that broadly globally um, and and we said you know it looks like it looks like people are generally focused on their own their own self-interest um, you know money talks in today's day and age um, you know, we have to not just have these grand philosophical ideas about what would be good, but we need to be able to meet people where they're at on their own, in their own day-to-day um, -day life. And so our basic idea was, <clears throat> if it is true that when plants are healthier, that the, that the food, the crops are more nutritious, um, maybe we should be focusing on the nutrient levels of the food um, as the objective not by the pound or by the certification label, um, et cetera, but by the inherent nutritional value. Um, and so that's basically been our, our insight and our work um, for the past four or five years now. We've become, you know, originally I, got, was, I was sort of 
I was known as the guy who was talking about remineralization and you know bringing back those various minerals, rocks, sea salt, things like that that the that the minerals that the soil needed for life to function more well and and then it got into the sort of um, you know deeper principles of life thing. But for the past few years, we've been really focusing on um, what is quality and how can we test it and how can we bring it forth. And so, um, so we've had this project going now since 2016, where uh, we had three basic objectives. One was to uh, understand the variation in nutrient levels in food. Um, if you think about maybe a carrot you buy from the grocery store and a carrot you pull from the garden or a tomato you buy from the grocery store and a tomato you pick up the garden or a, a peach you buy at the grocery store or a peach you pick off a tree, um, you know that there is a variation in those crops, right? You as an animal are hardwired with a very sophisticated ability to discern what is good and what is less good. Um, if a carrot tastes bitter uh, or soapy, that's your animal instinct telling you it's not that good for you. Um, if a tomato tastes or doesn't taste, you know, has the consistency more like a cucumber, um, that's your animal instinct telling you it's not that good for you. Um, and those things, those those things that your instinct knows directly, you know, Western science can identify. Um, so we can talk about levels of copper and zinc and antioxidants and polyphenols and vitamins and enzymes. Um, and so what we've been doing, um, we had you know three basic objectives. One is to identify the variation in nutrient levels in food. Um, you know, this rice to that rice, this 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 kale to that kale. Um, the second thing is to identify what are the dynamics which cause those variations. So what caused this kale to be more flavorful, more nutritious, this kale to be less so. Um, <clears throat> and then finally can we develop a, a way of testing um, that anybody can use um, that is scientific and empirical and can't be um, co-opted. Uh, my parents, uh, as I said, worked for an organic farming organization and helped write some of the first organic standards in the 1980s in this country. Um, and I watched as a child, you know, as that movement grew, um, companies and the government basically came in and said, um, we want to control this thing, and and they and they did. They took it over. The government said, "Now the word organic means to us, it belongs to us." And um, and people who've been following following this know that the standards have been getting weaker and weaker. That you now don't have to grow plants in soil. You don't have to have animals on the land, and they still can be certified organic. Things that would be, you know, outrageous. You know, based on what was the understanding 30 years ago. Um, so how do you test nutrient levels in food and keep it honest and prevent it from being co-opted or perverted or, or controlled? Um, so what is quality? What's the variation? What causes quality? And then finally, um, how do you test it? And so um, we, uh, in 2018, built our first lab in Michigan. And we had uh, people go to the grocery store, go to the farmer's market, um, go to their gardens and send in, we just did carrots and spinach that year, send in samples of carrots and spinach from across the country. And we had you know, the ability to test a bunch of elements, copper and zinc and calcium and potassium and you know, cobalt and you know, zinc and things like that. And then we also were able to test antioxidants and polyphenols. And so we just, we literally tested, um, I think it was eight or 900 um, samples of carrots and spinach, and we found variations that were massive in the nutrient levels. Um, I think it was, you know, we'll say it was copper and carrots, you know, maybe this carrot had three times as much copper in it as that carrot. So if you were looking for copper, you would have to eat three of these carrots to get the same amount as you got from that carrot. And when it was iron and spinach, it was 18 to one. So you would get as much iron in this one leaf of spinach as you would get in these 18 leaves of spinach. Um, and then when we looked at antioxidants and polyphenols, which are fancy names for things that are, you know, good for you, com fancy, you know, complicated compounds, nutritious compounds that correlate with flavor and health giving attribute, it was more like 75 to one or hundred to one. Literally, you'd have to eat, you know, a hundred leaves of this spinach to get as many antioxidants as you got out of this one spinach leaf. So 
really quite profound variation. This is something that doesn't really isn't really out there um, <clears throat> in the broader awareness. If you look at a bag of carrots at the grocery store, it'll have a USDA label. It'll say it has this much vitamin D and this much iron or whatever. And that's based on the USDA average. Um, it's not based on actually testing those carrots. And what we found is depending on how a carrot is grown, um, it can be a lot better than the USDA average or it can be worse. And so our thought was if we can give people the ability to make those choices, if you could, you know, if you're going to the grocery store, if you buy food at a store and, you know, you're given three, you know, a bunny love bag or an, or a Calorganic bag or a, um, the Bolthouse Farms bag of carrots to choose from. And you can see, you know, the Bolthouse Farms will say is it the 20th percentile of what a carrot could be. And the Calorganic is at the 40th percentile of what a carrot could be. And the um, bunny love is at the 80th percentile of what a carrot could be. They all cost relatively similar dollars per pound, my thought is you are likely to buy the one that tastes more like a carrot and is more nutritious. And so um, so we've been able to, in 2018, we just did carrots and spinach. And then in 2019, we added four more crops, let, lettuce and kale and cherry tomatoes and grapes. And then last year we did, uh, I think about 20 crops, oats and wheat and potatoes and beets and Swiss chard and leeks and peppers and all kinds of things. Um, and we can continue to find this massive variation um, in the nutrient levels in food. Um, in 2019 and 2020, we also uh, worked with growers to uh, document basically their management practices. Which variety did you use? When did you plant it? Did you use any fertilizer? Did you till? Did you use cover crops? Um, just those kind of management conditions, um, management factors data. And then we asked them just to um, when they pull the carrot or pull the, you know, whatever it is, the leak to <clears throat> also take a sample of soil, the top four inches and then, and then four inches to eight inches and send that in along with it. So we're able to connect the management practices, environmental conditions, causal sort of factors with soil dynamics, soil mineral levels, soil biological activity, soil organic matter with nutrient levels in crops. Um, so we've been able to do that as well. Um, and then finally, the piece that I think Joyce was touching on there was the um, the meter. And we've been able to build a, a handheld, um, it's called a spectrometer. Basically, it flashes um, 10 different frequencies of light at the carrot or at the cucumber. And it reads the light that bounces back. And through that process of reading the light that bounces back, it can see what is or is not in the carrot. Um, this is the science that's called spectroscopy. And, you know, um, astrophysicists talk about the various stars, you know, Alpha Centauri is 51% hydrogen and 48% helium and 1% other gases in various levels and ratios. And they know that not because anybody's ever been to Alpha Centauri, it's light years away, right? We've never been to any of these other stars, but every element in chemistry is a vibration in physics. So copper vibrates at a certain frequency, zinc vibrates at a certain frequency, and that vibration is light. And so basically by flashing a light at a carrot, if we can understand how to read the light that bounces back, we can literally go to those three bags of carrots and say, boop, boop, 20th percentile, boop, boop, 40th percentile, boop, boop, 80th percentile. And so, um, yeah, that's basically what we've been doing for the past four or five years. Um, you know, we're we're very dogmatic about being open source, about all of our, our our data being in the commons, about the engineering for our instruments being in the commons, the the app, everything is open source. It's not like I mean, you can build one year of your own. Um, we you know, we're not controlling the information. Um, so. Uh, at this point, I would say we have proved the concept of, of this idea. We can identify nutrient variations. We can correlate it to management conditions, and we can build instruments with which it can be tested. And so um, now we're at the stage of, um, you know, taking it from proof of concept to, to market ready. And that might be another couple of years, but... Um, our idea is that if anybody globally has the ability to choose what food they purchase based on its nutritional value, and any grower globally has access to guidance about how to improve the nutritional value of food, um, that we can, through economic leverage, through you know a lot of people buy food with money, 
if we can support people in buying food that's more nutritious, then we can support growers in producing food that's more nutritious, which will build soil, um, which will heal the environment, and which will heal our bodies. Um, you know, the whole thing about you are what you eat. Um, <clears throat> if you eat junk, you become junk. <laughs> if you eat vitality and, and um, you know, coherence, you become that. And so my, my personal thought is that as, you know, as we have been building our bodies out of incoherent substance, out of mass produced monoculture, abused land, abused plants, abused animals, we have become incoherent ourselves. And a lot of our cultural struggles have to do with the fact that we are not internally coherent. And so, um, yeah, it's just our idea that if we can support people in doing a better job um, and becoming more whole in that very, very basic level, um, maybe we can have a, 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 a space where culture can be healed, you know, environment can be healed and we can have a better life for our, for our children and grandchildren. So um, that's my soil story ramble. Um, I'll uh, happily, I'd love to engage conversations. I'd much prefer to be in conversation than monologue. Thank you so much. It's incredible. Uh, very, very special work that you're doing. And we're humbled to have you and grateful to have you with us. Um, but the message is so, so coherent, like you said at the end, and uh, more nutrients in the food, more health in the food from these principles that are so vital. So, um, you know, we, we have relatively a smaller group tonight than we normally have, and that's not a reflection of you at all, actually. That's a reflection of getting a little zoomed out and summer happening. So, but the people Being on the- free to go out and engage people in the real world, probably <laughs> now. <laughs> exactly. In a way that we haven't been for far too long, yeah. But I was thinking since we have a tighter knit group, um, maybe we could go around and ask people to make a comment or a question so everyone has an opportunity if possible. And obviously people can write in the chat. It looks like Brian turned his video on. Okay, so Brian, why don't you go for it? Yeah, I have a question. <laughs> Um, uh, really interesting, Dan. Um, I think I had heard about, uh, this, um, this method that you developed the, the spectroscopy, um, on another podcast that I was listening to like months ago and I couldn't figure out what it was or who I didn't have enough information. So it's awesome that you, uh, you popped up on the, on this, um, forum. So that's great. Um, I guess my question is, um, can you, or have you kind of closed the loop on the process, you know, that you mentioned where you actually can kind of correlate practices, growing practices and, and the nutrients and kind of feed that back to the growers so they can um, kind of evolve practices and, and increase their uh, nutrient density of the food? Yeah, I mean, it's been a process because, you know, as a nonprofit, doing all of our work on charitable donations, not taking any investment dollars, and we're running, you know, four labs at this point, um, three in North America and one in Europe, and we're engineering scientific instruments, and we're writing code and everything else. So it's been a real, a real pain in the butt to raise the money to get the work done. Um, so I'd, I'd like to be farther along than we are, but um, yeah, we do now have this thing um, um, where you basically it's a dashboard and anybody who submits their sample can, their, their carrot or their cucumber, can see where it stands in the continuum and they can see, um, you know, what, where other people stood in the continuum and they can see what other people did. So you can say, you know, I planted, you know, Scarlet Nantes variety. I want to look at all the other people who planted scarlet nantes and i want to see who did better than me and you know what was their soil type what was their region what was their management practice what was their fertility program and so yeah we do have that capacity for people to actually anybody who engages i mean anybody can go on there and check and see 
you know, what the farmers did who got the results to the best of our ability to do collect data, which is of course never perfect, but um, <clears throat> yeah. And I think there's gonna be a new update. Um, we're calling it like a d digital coffee shop basically where it's exactly for that purpose. So that any grower who wants to engage in this process of learning can engage any other grower and you know, you're able to talk to each other and we're not trying to control the process. We're just trying to create a, a structure where that learning can happen. Um, you know, horizontally. That being said, we have found that a lot of the things called soil health practices like minimal till or no till, like cover crops, you know, do generally correlate with increased nutrient levels in food. So, um, you know, things like organic depends. <clears throat> some organic is done really well, some organic is not done really well. Um, you know, a lot of the labels you really can't predict what the um, nutrient levels are going to be because the labels don't necessarily correlate with the practice from a soil health standpoint. Um, but the practices do seem to seem to step up, uh, show themselves as, you know, the things that we understand build soil and build soil life do seem to correlate with increased nutrient levels. Thank you, Brian. Hey. For, yeah, I appreciate that. Yeah. yeah. And I'm, I'm gonna continue around the room in the community sense of participation and you're free to say pass if you don't wanna make a comment or ask a question. How about Daryl? Is there a question or comment from Daryl? Uh, yeah, there is. Uh, thanks, Dan, for the presentation. I've been following you for about three years now. And my question is, I'm working on how do you, how do you take these practices into your own home garden? vegetable garden and create a better quality food, um, a, a greater density in your food. And there seems to be very little input into how to do that on a really small scale. Like I work with about 1400 square feet and yet what I do in the garden obviously changes the nature and the quality of the food. So how, are, are you working on some way to get that into a garden, a garden level at different uh, engagements of gardening? And how do you know, without a documentation, without an instrument, how do you know uh, you're being successful? Yeah, well, I think, you know, the work we did earlier on, starting maybe 10 years ago or so, was these, these courses we called Principles of Biological Systems. And it was all about understanding it doesn't matter what size of a grower you are you know it can right. be a pot on a shelf in a kitchen or it can be a thousand acres you know it's the microbes that are the gut flora of the plant and they have to be happy or things don't work and they need air to breathe and water to drink and you know food to eat and minerals to build their bodies out of and they have to be there and if you don't have any of those five things when I give my course, that's really what I try to focus on is, you know, ensuring the spectrum of microbes are present, um, you know, ensuring sufficient aeration and hydration um, and and food for them. And, you know, the one piece that I, I've been talking about, which I think a lot of others don't, is the, the spectrum of minerals. Um, we understand that, you know, for life to function, it, there's dozens of different elements that are necessary. And in many cases, the full spectrum is not present. And so, um, remineralization is, is one piece of that puzzle, but, um, yeah, I mean, we've, it, I like to think of it as, as a sort of a way of, a way of being, a way of understanding. Um, and, you know, I definitely talk a lot about, um, communion or, uh, communication with plants. Um, having grown up on a yep. farm myself, it's yep. fairly easy to go out into the field and, hear them talking to me, you know, like yeah, yeah. they're thirsty every morning, <laughs> every morning. Then water them. <laughs> you know, yeah. however you get your, do you feel it? Do you, do you hear it? Do yeah, you just exactly. know it? Right. Everybody's got right. their way of communication, but I would say we're all wired with that capacity. And to me, that is what indigenousness is, is that communion, communion, communication with life. Um, yeah, yeah, we're all wired with that practice. I, I agree with that. And yet, how do you put that practice in a day-to-day, season-to-season application on a small scale in your own garden? 
that's what I'm currently working on. Me specifically? I do or? polycultures and, and cover crops and rotate through your garden. And there don't seem to be many, very many guidelines around about doing that. I think part of the problem is that every piece of land is unique. And uh, absolutely. You can't really have guidelines if, if it's a relationship with life. It, you no know, you can have some huh? basic principles, but yeah. it has to be a living, a living conversation and, and communication. Um, yeah. So people yeah. keep asking me, what do we call this? I'm like, we don't call it. I what do we know. label it? We don't label it. Yeah. It's life. Yeah. It's <laughs> yeah. and to your to your to your other question, how do you know you're doing better? You do have a, a very sophisticated quote unquote scientific instrument, which is your tongue. Right. Um, and if it tastes good, if it has aroma, um, if it if it leaves your body feeling vibrant or vitalized afterwards, that is the real answer. It's not a, a level of copper and zinc in relationship to each other. Um, well, thank thank you very much for your work. You've been a you've been a guiding light for my own little garden and my own thank you. food. I'm doing what I can. Yeah. yeah. Thank you, Daryl, and uh, it's really wonderful the conversation. And I wanted to give Joan Kelly a chance to chime in if she likes. I I would I would love to to chime in. Um, great presentation, Dan. Um, so one of the questions I have, and I'll give you some background. Um, I, I grew up kind of uniquely in the suburbs, but my father got into organic gardening and you know we were the only lawn that was filled with dandelions. And so I guess my question is Father's Day is coming up. And I was wondering if, if I could purchase a spectrometer to send to my dad so he could uh, test um, his vegetables. And <laughs> Can I buy one somewhere or, or? Oh, oh, it's like seriously, like, can you buy one? That was your question? Yes. Um, yes. Yeah. I mean, actually, uh, well, big fat caveat. I like to call them an apple too. Um, if you are, you know, if you know the history of, of the Apple company and the products, you know, the first computer, the first personal computer was very rudimentary. And if you weren't a coder, you had a hard time using it. And then they went through the Macintoshes and the, and the MacBook Airs and things like that. And then they had the iPhone. And so <clears throat> what we have right now that you can purchase is a Apple II. It's very rudimentary. Um, I think we've got eight crops. We've got calibrations for right now. Um, we're, we shipped out the instruments themselves. Uh, we had a, a first batch we sent out, I think two years ago. And it, it all it did was spit out a like a, a peaks and valleys on a, on a graph reading, which doesn't mean anything to anybody. Um, and now that we've run enough samples of crops, we can say, you know, we think this is in the 80th percentile of polyphenols and the 30th percentile of antioxidants and the, you know, whatever. So um, we, yeah, you go to bionutrient.org and you find the bionutrient meter and order one. Um, they're $377. It's a membership benefit. So you have to be a member of the organization. Um, they're, I just, you know, I want to make sure you understand they're not slick and easy to use. Um, but I, I think at some point there might be a collector's item. You know, if we, uh, if this is, if this is the first generation of something that becomes the ray gun that tra transforms the planet, you know, there's only a few hundred of them out there. So <laughs> right. and might I mean, be, I love might be a good investment. <laughs> Your taste test too, because it is so true. You know, I mean, um, the mono crops, they're growing things to, um, you know, survive shipping. And so tomatoes, the skin is tough and they're flavorless when they you buy those. Green. They pick them green. They pick the peaches right. green. And they, I mean, if you picked a tomato green out of your garden and let it sit in the counter for three months, it might turn pink, but it probably wouldn't taste good. So right, why do you expect right. the tomatoes in the grocery store to taste good? <laughs> right, right. And and the varieties are bred to handle shipping, and the you know the traditional varieties, the open pollinated heirloom varieties, were selected for flavor because right. people were growing food for their families. And so, you know, right. those those traditional varieties have a much better inherent capacity. So management is one thing, but genetics is certainly another. And then early childhood development is, an, you know, I mean, there's so many pieces of this puzzle. Um, if you start your seedlings in little trays of potting soil that is not 
natural and with some fertilizer and they're three weeks old and they're, they're, you know, they've got a, a, a cubic inch of soil to grow in, you know, right. to stick a child in a crib for five months or five years, you know, until they're ready to go out into the ground and it's going to screw them up. You know, the things we do to our plants are really abusive. Um, if you want to look at it that way that we're taught, um, a tomato, a tomato germinates in the garden, you know, a month or six weeks after you start the tomatoes inside and damn if that one is, if it's not doing better, you know, <laughs> in two months than the ones you put all the time and energy into, right? If we have had that experience over and over, maybe we should learn that we're not making things better by going through all this hassle beforehand. Um, right. Anyway, so. All right, thank you very much. Yes, yes. <laughs> and thank you, Joan, so much. And Carrie made a nice comment of appreciation, Dan, that you can see in the chat. Thank and you. Jeremy had a question about soil testing beyond what you're uh, discussing. And, and if there's any additional soil test you, you like or you'd recommend or you, and he mentioned the Haney test and others. Yeah. Um, so uh, the Haney test is good at telling you what the um, general level of biological activity and nutrient availability from a biological perspective is, um, which is certainly, I think, uh, you know, and tells you whether you need to add fertilizer or not. Um, we, we have a, a conference we've been running, you know, we were having our, our 10th annual this year, and we just had Rick Haney on a couple of weeks ago talking about his, his test. Um, and I'm guessing the plant sap analysis is an oblique reference to what John Kemp's been doing. Um, I'll just say when we had John on at the beginning of the conference in February, um, his recommendation was that we start with a like a geological assay, like you um, dig down three feet and you see what minerals are not present in your soil. In some cases, boron is not there, or molybdenum is not there, or sulfur is not there, and we understand these things are critical. So, from a you know one time only, um, you know actually assess what's in your soil profile, and if you find that there are certain things that are not there, then then bring them in and amend amend them. Um, I I'm a big advocate of rock dust and sea salt. I think out of which the you know continents and the oceans are made, we have the full suite of nutrients we would need to to remineralize soils that maybe have been weathered for thousands or hundreds of thousands or millions of years. Um, I'm not sure how long the last time was that you had glaciation in, in New Mexico. I'm guessing it was probably a little while back. Um, you know, um, so every, every bioregion has underlying mineral deficiencies. And I do think um, that kind of a test, I think John recommended a, a, um, a, um, a geological soil core and then a, an Albrecht style assessment um, simultaneously, but do that once to see what is not what is and what is not present in the in in the soil, um, and then from that point on we shouldn't really need to be doing that kind of thing. You know, John recommends um, supplementation with foliar sprays, um, which I think can address a lot of these things systemically. Um, you know, we are working to, I mean, th th there's a, there's a, a deeper conversation about testing and, and what should you be testing and what's the paradigm. A lot of the soil tests historically have been a sort of a, a chemistry set perspective that have been, you know, in large part designed to sell fertilizer. Um, and we're looking for an assessment of how the living system's doing. Um, and so the plant sap analysis is basically telling you how the plant is doing um, right now. What's it got in it? What, is it, what doesn't it have in it? Um, it is, I think, cost prohibitive. If you're doing a, you know, a small market garden, one, two, three acres, and maybe you're doing a couple dozen different crops, um, you know, you're supposed to send samples from the, this tomato every 10 days for you know, 16 times or eight times, and it's 100 bucks a pop. And then you have to do on the cucumbers and the carrots and everybody else, all of a sudden it, it does become cost prohibitive. So part of what we're um, building as our, our instrumentation solution set are meters that you can use to test the plant in real time. So it's not just about testing the crop at the grocery store or the farmer's market. It's about testing the plant 
and seeing what it needs. Um, and, you know, I've been talking to John about this for a couple of years and he's waiting for me to get done putting the damn thing together. He's like, when are you going to get this thing done, Dan? We need it. <laughs> so, um, yeah. Uh, in other times and places, people talk to their plants. They communed, they had direct conversation, connection, um, and they were able to discern in that way. And I always like to say, I think there's something very important there. But, you know, those of us who've been brought up in this colonized cultural mindset haven't been trained, haven't had those muscles trained. And so um, if we can use science and we can use instruments and technology to help us come back to a deeper connection, I think that's a great thing. Um, so that's great, Dan. I, I was just finished reading Braiding Sweetgrass and you, you speak the same language as uh, Robin Wall Kim, Kimmerer. So uh, it's wonderful to hear this message over and over actually we need to. Um, I know we're running a little bit short on time and we have announcements at the end and we want to respect the hour, but I wanted to give a few more people a chance to comment. Hi, Dan. I think we've passed once or twice before. I know your name. I'm like, who is that? I, I, I think I know who she, I, <laughs> I don't recollect, but I'm pretty sure. Yes. <laughs> yeah, I'm curious, where are the labs? that are working on all this instrumentation and what are these university labs? Are they private labs? Um, well, we've, we've, you know, <clears throat> set them up through charitable donations. Uh, the, the, the initial lab was in Ann Arbor where our, some of our partners who um, have built our first generation instrument are based. Um, they were working at, at uh, Michigan state and um we provided them an opportunity to do this open source thing, which was their, you know, their fantasy. And they said, great, let's go for it. Our second lab is uh, at Chico State in California. Um, and so they are doing our nutrient density assessment along with a lot of their regenerative um, management practice, uh, you know, research, side-by-side -side trials and things like that. Um, the third lab is in France. Um, and it's a, in partnership with a, a group. Um, uh, Blue Blancour is a is the only real market label I know out there, which actually is is correlated to nutrient levels in food. It's been on on animal products historically, but they'll you know they they can say this beef, this pork, this milk, these eggs have these <clears throat> healthy omega three, omega six ratios, and things like that. So. Um, uh, this is, it's a group in France that's been, you know, doing a lot of great work um, to connect what the animals eat, how healthy they are, their vet, their vet bills, the quality of the, of the milk or the eggs that they produce, and then also connecting it to the health of the humans. And so they've done trials where they've done, um, you know, the chickens that are eating a balanced diet will take those eggs and feed to these people. The chickens that are eating an unbalanced diet will take those eggs and feed to those people and we'll watch what happens to the people after two weeks or four weeks or, or two months, you know, what does their blood, you know, compound levels, how do they change? And, you know, 20 years ago, they, they did this research and found that <laughs> when you eat food from, in this case, animals that are healthy, you know, your body gets healthier, your, um, your uh, <clears throat> um, inflammation markers, disappear and all kinds of other exciting things. So um, that was our third lab. And then our fourth lab is in, in Boston. Um, and that's where we're working to, to um, engineer the next generation of, of instruments and start to really properly define variation and um, define nutrient density. Right now, we've only been looking at a couple, a few elements and a couple compounds. Um, we're starting to work on beef uh, this year and it looks like dairy as well. Um, and I've just been reviewing the beef proposal and we're gonna look at 500 compounds um, um, really looking at, you know, the, a much more sophisticated biochemical analysis and hoping to be able to come out with a, <clears throat> a formal answer about, you know, I said before, this carrot's in the 80th percentile, this carrot's in the 20th percentile. You can't make that statement until you've defined variation comprehensively and you've got serious scientists who've looked at it and said, this makes sense. Um, and the data we've been collecting so far has not been good enough to do that with. So we can say this has a high level of antioxidants or low level of polyphenols, but we can't say right now 
this is better or this is worse. And so um, <clears throat> our new lab in Boston is going to be hoping, hopefully taking that, um, moving, moving to that level along with the next generation instruments. I hope okay. I answered your question. Yeah, so, yeah, thanks. So the proof is really in the pudding. And uh, I was going to say that, uh, Mary, that's a great question and thank you. And I was, I was wanting to give one more opportunity. How about Mar Marie Nava? Would you like to ask a question or make a comment? Yes. I'm not sure if I put my video on, but can you hear me? Yeah. Yes, we can see you and hear you. <laughs> All right. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> um, thank you for the presentation. I think you're doing fantastic work. And I came a little bit late, so I would like to know if you're still teaching the principals courses and if you have a website that we could learn more. Um, <clears throat> I, I go where invited is the general principle. Um, we don't push our work anywhere. We just wait until people say, hey, we'd love to have you come down here and have a conversation. So um, we did one course last year in, I think, Maryland. We had three or four set up and they all got canceled. Um, um, I have talked to James and um, Joyce about potentially doing something down there in New Mexico. Um, we do have the course recorded and it is freely available online on YouTube to watch. Uh, we've had some number of tens of thousands or more of views of it. It's 12 hours. Um, um, but uh, yeah, and, and Isabel just put the, the website in, it's bionutrient.org. Um, so Great. yeah. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you so much, Dan. I, I, we all so uh, appreciate what you're doing and it's making the world a better place. And we're um, very moved by your work. Um, I, I wanted to give you a chance to have a closing comment and then Isabel has a, an announcement and then we'll let people go on their way. Closing comment. <clears throat> um, yeah, there's so many things to say. Uh, you know, um, uh, I think we all have this ability to connect to nature, life, and I think it is where our fulfillment and meaning and purpose come from, and um, maybe even our value. And so I think, you know, as I've been talking to James and Joyce about the, um, you know, the indigenous perspective, the Native American perspective, the sort of all of that, I think that there's a, a, a real lot that um, um, needs to be brought more forth. Um, I've been doing it to my ability, but as you can see, I'm a, you know, of European descent. Um, I think, you know, I was, my, my people were colonized, you know, 2000 years ago. <laughs> so I, I think we're all in a similar, similar boat here, but um, yeah, I, I'm, I'm, I'm excited to be able to be doing this work. And um, I think that there's all these amazing webs of, of, of people, networks, groups, organizations around the world who are aligned in principle with this relationship with nature and um, and being able to build a, a structure that is at once empirical and <clears throat> scientific, but also intuitive and economic, um, being able to come together around solutions feels feels very, um, you know, promising. So um, I know a lot of people, uh, I hear people <laughs> talking about how the world is going to hell in a, in a handbasket and, you know, what was us and climate crisis and political crisis and everything else. And I think it's really about where you put your, your mind and your heart. Um, and I think, I think nature is actually the power. Um, so I'm always looking for collaborators and allies. I'll stop there. James had a comment. Let people know how New Mexico can be a part of the research. Um, oh, and yeah. I agree, New Mexico can be part of the research and we need to be, we must be. And we have such rich traditions of Pueblos and tribes that we can, can contribute mightily to this conversation, of course. So 
Um, I agree with James and- Well, let me just, if I can respond to sure. that, because it's a very good point. Thank you of for course. bringing that up. Um, you know, we do have this process where people are sending in samples of their crops to the lab. And, um, you know, we've been trying to do geographic, um, you know, a fair representation of geography and, and soil types and things like that. And so I've been talking to James and Joyce about what the, some of the varieties, um, the traditional varieties, um, and we don't have a lot of samples from the Southwest. So um, you can go to, I think it now is a bionutrientinstitute.org and sign up to be a grower partner. Um, and yeah, and we would love to take your, your samples into the lab and test them and tell you where you stand. And um, if you're feeling self-conscious, understand that everybody um, controls their data and no one needs to know that it's yours except for you, unless you want to tell them. So um, <laughs> that's the way, that's the way it works. That's really great. Thank you yeah. so much, Dan. That was, that was fascinating. And I, I do look forward to further collaborate and uh, um, very, very eye opening. I really appreciate your um, combination of, of science, uh, common sense, as you might say, farmer, farmer knowledge, right. And, uh, and also your quest for indigeneity. That's, that's really um, shared here. So thank you so much.